afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I'm the director of the Tyndall Center, like Jay said uh, initially. Uh, and uh, just a few words before I start about the core of my presentation on climate change. Uh, just a few words about the Tyndall Center. It's a research center. Uh, it was founded in 2000, so 14 years ago. And it was founded to look at the interface between climate change and society. So to look at what it means climate change from all of our physical understanding, which was not as complete as the, at the time. In 2000, it wasn't as uh, clearly demonstrated, the warming of the climate system, the influence of greenhouse gases on that warming and so on. And then to accept the uncertainty in our knowledge and to look at what it means for society in terms of adaptation, mitigation, and how we get these things into place. And it was so, um, it, the, the climate then was so a bit shaky that there was accusation or suspicions that looking at adaptation, for instance, would undermine the mitigation effects of climate change. And so it was a bit controversial when the center uh, was founded in 2000. And if you look at uh, the book of abstracts today, you can see that the landscape has completely changed. Uh, research is far more rich uh, in the climate change area, and it covers almost all aspects of society in the UK, in Europe, and worldwide. And all this in only 14 years, and I think it's a tremendous advance forward for the field of climate change research that it's really expanded beyond the physical aspects of climate change. That's not all, of course, thanks to the Tyndall Center, but the Tyndall Center has played its role in this landscape. It's a cross-university institute across eight universities in the UK, Cambridge, Cardiff, Oxford, Manchester, Newcastle, Southampton, and Sussex. And many of you are here in the room today. And it also has, since two years, a new uh, Tyndall Center in uh, Shanghai, so Fudan University, which expands the scope of research even more by including aspects of, for instance, the interaction between air quality and mitigation of climate change. Uh, one thing that the Tyndall Center has tried to do is push a little bit controversial topics. So it had, uh, for instance, in 2008, made a conference on the limits to adaptation, which was really trying to look at what actually can we and can we not adapt to, and also a follow-up conference on uh, four degrees of climate change and beyond, what did it look like to have a climate, uh, climate warming of four degrees rather than the two degrees that everybody was talking about. And we had another conference just before Christmas in December, as some of you might have attended, on radical emission reductions to see how fast and what are the blockages, the limits, and also the opportunities of really rapidly decreasing our emissions of the scale and scope that you need to keep global warming uh, below two degrees. And then I was really pleased when the topic of discussion came from this, this, uh, from this conference that a lot of uh, the topic has been picked up, has been expanded, and, and now that this conference is going to look much beyond, but still in the same, the same direction, of looking at how one can address the speed, the scale, and scope of adaptation and mitigation in the climate change area. Uh, I'm uh, staying to the conference until tomorrow night and not until Friday, so I'll just take the occasion that I'm here in the podium uh, to thank very much uh, Xing Fang Wang, Jay, uh, Jay Skouriakis, and William Lam for organizing the conference, but also primarily actually for thinking, for driving intellectually uh, the topic uh, of this conference. Uh, the Tyndall Center is a network, really, and, and whatever happens is, is really what the members make of it. And in this case, it's the PhD researchers who really have come forward and every year organize this conference, uh, both, as I said, intellectually and practically. Uh, let me now move on uh, to the topic of the conference, uh, of my presentation here. What I would like uh, to uh, cover is really the physical understanding of climate change to start with and then move a little bit to the implications. 
And I'll start by discussing a little bit the two degree target. So uh, there's uh, a lot of talk about limiting global climate change to two degrees of warming above pre-industrial temperature. Uh, these discussions have emerged sometime in the 1990s, so quite a while ago, as a focal point at the time there was just limiting climate change at large, and you don't really know what you're talking about when you don't have actually a number to grasp. And so this was seen as a very positive development, this two degree target. In 2008, it was adopted by, 2009 was adopted by the G8. So the richest country have made a statement that limiting climate change to two degree was, uh, was a, a goal uh, to um, ensure the safety of the planet. And then in 2010, it was included for the first time in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change that oversees the UNFCCC, that oversees uh, the uh, international negotiations and protocols on climate change. And although there was more and more through time, and even now more and more commitment to, to, the, to the two degree target, at the same time the emissions of CO2 have increased and actually have grown by 2.5% on average each year since year 2000, so in the past almost 15 years, 14 years now, in spite of the fact that concerns have grown. And just to back off a little bit, why is why do we have the two degree target? Is it just random? The scientists pick two or could they have picked three and make our life not so complicated? And I want to say a few bases here of why the two degree target is actually grounded in scientific understanding. So the two degree, two degree was the warmest temperature that we can reconstruct for the past 800,000 years where we can reconstruct climate from uh, ice trapped in uh, ice core that uh, have been taken out of Antarctica primarily. So because uh, we can reconstruct this global temperature, then there's analogs in the geological, temp uh, geological record that the Earth has recently, in its current configurations of continents and so on, has recently uh, undergone this temperature. And so there's a relative stability to a uh, two degree of warming. There is no analog for plus four degree of warming, but there's an analog for minus four to five degrees of cooling. And that comes from uh, glaciation. So the Earth has gone natural cycles of being in a glacial world and, 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 and a, a non-glacial world uh, uh, roughly every 100,000 years in the past probably 2 million years. So 4 and 5 degree change in temperature on the other side is the equivalent of going into a glaciation. And in a glaciation, the world is actually transformed. The world surface is transformed compared to its surface today. The ice coverage is far uh, more uh, to the south. So there was a mile of ice in the north of England, Ireland, uh, north of uh, America. Uh, the sea level was 140 meters uh, below current level. And there was also transformation in the forest and uh, vegetation around the world. And of course, we're not expecting this for a plus four degree, but it's the other way around. But this gives you a scale, uh, an order of magnitude of what actually a four degree of global temperature change means for the world that surrounds us. So it's really, uh, it, it, we're talking about a transformation, whereas at the two degree uh, change, we're talking about changes that, uh, that build onto what we have today. Between these two temperatures, there is a world of difference, but there's a lot of uncertainty about what the world would look like, for instance, at the three degree of climate change. There are things that we don't know in science. There are thresholds in the climate system, so-called tipping points, and we, uh, in many cases, we don't know what their levels are and we don't know how quickly that they can be transformed there. This is the image that you see here. Some of the tipping points are, for instance, the melting of the Arctic sea ice, which is underway. The Arctic sea ice is now 40%, uh, uh, summer coverage is 40% uh, 
uh, lower than it was just 30 years ago. There are thresholds in the Indian monsoon of stability where the position moves uh, with different stability level thresholds in the North Atlantic thermal hairline circulation, in the permafrost, in the Amazon and, and boreal forest. And all of these thresholds mean that there can come a point of warming where the transformation is inevitable or at least to uh, some extent. And, uh, and the science of understanding these thresholds is not uh, extremely advanced at the moment. At the same time, the risks and costs of warming be two, between 2 and 4 have been little explored. There's been a lot of exploration of below 2 degrees, but of course the higher you go, the more away we go from current society, and it's really quite difficult to put even a number on risks and, uh, needless to say, a number on, on the financial implications. We have now uh, 0.85 degrees Celsius of warming, so not quite uh, uh, one degree. We have had a lot of changes in, in uh, well, the temperature of the surface, obviously, but also in water patterns with uh, wet regions generally becoming wetter, and some places more intense uh, waterfall, uh, dry regions generally becoming drier. Uh, we have seen a rise in sea level, melting of snow and ice everywhere, uh, uh, increases in some extremes, and uh, shifts in ecosystems. And the latest IPCC report that was published, just the first three reports are just out now. The synthesis report will be published in September. They highlight, the reports highlight these various implications. And one of the things that it highlights is that the impacts for a society, particularly for the production of food, is, uh, is um, thought to be more negative impacts than positive impacts, even for low degrees of warming. And that the impacts would be worse for pe poor people in developing countries, uh, obviously because of the capacity to adaptation is much more limited. Another point that I want to make about uh, the scientific understanding is that uh, it is, is about committed warming and irreversibility. Uh, the warming that has been committed, so this 0.85 degrees that we've seen already, is essentially largely irreversible for multiple centuries to millennia. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, we uh, stop, if we were able to stop emissions, greenhouse gases emissions straight away, there would be no further warming. The uh, warming would uh, essentially level off. So that the future warming is in the future emissions and not in the past emissions. There's been also an analysis of what infrastructure that we have already and how much warming would be brought up by, uh, just by the infrastructure that we already have. So that's cars, uh, appliances, power stations and so on, power plants and so on. And according to this analysis, even if we let these infrastructure just uh, finish their natural life, the warming would be only about 1.3 degrees above pre-industrial, and that has led the authors to say that the source of the most threatening emissions, so the ones that lead us above 2 degree warming, have yet to be built. So there's an incredible amount of power that society has to control climate change because it's not like if we do something, nothing happens in the future, but if we do something now, then uh, emissions actually do decrease or stop in the future with an implications for climate change. And the emissions cut uh, that, uh, that it can take place right away immediately change the rate of warming uh, of uh, the climate on climate, on climate time scales. Uh, <clears throat> The last slide on, 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 on temperature that I want to show is this one here. The observed warming of global air temperature uh, from about 1865 to 2012 is the last year here. 2013 warming is uh, almost the same as 2012 here, so the last bar. As I said, 0.85 degrees of warming between 1880 and 2012. There's been a lot of focus, particularly in the UK uh, somehow, about the slower warming of the past 15 years, which I highlight here in this box. 
So you have the, 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 the there's a there's a warming trend even if you take 1998 as your initial year, which is this very high uh, unusual El Nino year here. There is a warming trend, but it's quite a bit slower than the warming trend of the previous 15 years. However, you can see with your eyes that there's a lot of natural variability in the climate system, and this is not immediately uh, unusual. But it's triggered a lot of attention, so it has also triggered a lot of study. Uh, one of them was about uh, very recently published about undersampling in the Arctic that actually makes the trend go up a little bit, but it doesn't explain it all. And so the explanations that have been put forward by the IPCC, although it's not all um, uh, resolved because this is a new uh, area of research because it's just so recent, uh, is primarily uh, in turn, um, natural variability and the redistribution of heat in the ocean from internal processes, uh, particularly changes in ocean circulation in the Pacific. Uh, there's been also uh, there's also a thought that there is a contribution from from a weak and declining solar cycle in a series of small volcanic eruptions. So contribution of also natural variability, but for an external source, uh, relatively small, but still uh, going in the same direction. There also has been an analysis published in 2013 by, uh, that highlights the possibility that the transient climate response, so the, the, how fast the climate warms for a given em emissions might uh, need to be, uh, so our, our, our estimate of that might need to be reduced by 20%. And uh, the expectation is in all cases that this trend will reverse eventually and there is an expectation that the long-term warming trend uh, will return back to 0.1, 2.5 degrees C uh, per uh, decade uh, above, above today, sorry, around 2025. So um, this puts you a little bit in the context of the uncertainty in the climate system, but also it starts to, a, a point that I want to start to talk about is the interface between the research community and society. Because there is no way that this trend is going to be fully elucidated by science, because for one thing we need more time, we need more research, more observations and so on, and there will always be uncertainty about the state of understanding of climate science and about particularly the warming projections for the future. And I really like this figure here that was just published by the IPCC, which puts all this all of our information about the research into the context of decision making. So let me uh, run you through the figure here. So on the left hand side we have our world here. Everything that is red is the stresses on society, uh, on, uh, sorry, the stresses on the earth. So that includes climate change, land use change, pollution and so on. What you have at the center, the yellow, is the social stresses, so increased population, increased use of land, use of resources, and so on. And the green space that is left in the middle is our resilience space. And if I then move you back all the way to the right-hand side, to the possible futures. Now, we have choices here. We can go to the top where the, the, the green space, sorry, the possible resilient space is maximized and the stresses, so the red space from climate change and other stresses in, is minimized and at the same time the social stresses is also minimized. Or we have a future that we can equally choose or land on because of lack of choice or decision making. But, uh, but there's, uh, in, in, the, in the low, um, uh, possible future of the earth, we have a very small resilient space and a lot of stress. And that means that the world has low resilience and high risk, whereas at the top we have high resilience and low risk. And you have then the opportunity space in the middle, with the green being the pathways that lead us to a high resilience, low risk society, and the red means the cutoff point and the, and the pathways that lead us to uh, the opposite. And I really like this because I think that it really reflects the way that the global society works. 
We have the UNFCCC convention that regulates climate change mitigation and adaptation in a large way, and they have a roadmap. And there's one very important threshold in this roadmap that is coming next year, 2015, the Paris meeting, where decisions will be made that will affect perhaps the 10, 20 year lifespan of, of, of climate change. So the next 20 years globally will be largely, not entirely, but largely regulated by the decisions that will be made in Paris next year. So it can be, say we're here just for the sake of argument, it can be that we have a very strong uh, 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 international protocol, the Paris Protocol, and we go along this pathway, and it can be that we have a very weak one and we go along this pathway. But then there was going to be eventually in the future another critical point, decision point as they call here, where we also will have then an opportunity to either rectify or uh, continue along the path that we so choose. And I think that to me this is very important because it means that as a, com as a community, the research community has to actually understand these decision points and play the full role that we can play which goes beyond the research but also to the communication of research and to the clarity of the research outcome for decision makers in the private and public sector so that information at least can be used uh, even if it in the end ha it is, it, well, I hesitate to say if it has to be ignored, I don't, uh, it, but at least the information is clear. Um, I'll take a few more minutes here to say uh, something about uh, projected global average temperature and particularly how that relates to uh, CO2 emissions. So we have temperature here on the top graph and of course in the future you need to decide how much emissions we're going to put in the atmosphere and that gives you a temperature <coughs> pathway. The uh, lower end here uh, stays below 2 degrees with a likely chance, whereas the higher, the red uh, scenario here, uh, goes to uh, 4.3 degrees on average, so between essentially 3 and 5. And if you look at the emissions that, uh, that correspond to these scenarios and compare them to the emissions that we've already put in the atmosphere to stay on the blue pathway we have only about half of the historical emissions that we can burn to stay on that pathway whereas with three times the historical emissions we go to this very high temperature uh, scenario and essentially coming out of the IPCC was a very important statement which is that temperature changes scales with cumulative emissions essentially. So we have a carbon budget that we can burn so you can essentially decide what is your threshold to degree and that gives you your carbon budget and then it's like a cake and then essentially you can decide whether you want to eat your cake now and eat it tomorrow or whether people eat it here or eat it somewhere else but the cake is the cake and that's it once it's when it, once it's been eaten, it's gone. And so that triggers actually a lot of implications. For instance, the biggest major one is that there is fuel on the ground that has to stay there, that, will, that we will not, will have to accept, that we will not burn all of the resources that we have, that we can make money out of it, that we can become more rich, more wealthy, and so on. It's underground and it will have to stay there. And that's going to be very, very difficult decisions to take. Where are we now in a few minutes? So this is the global CO2 emissions annual uh, from 1982 with the projections for 2013 here. The red path is the same one I showed before and the blue path is also the same one but there are some pathways now in the middle. And as you can see in terms of emissions, we're now following the most carbon intensive emissions trajectory that has been used to project climate change. Of course, what we get at the end of the century in terms of warming will depend a lot what happens throughout the century and not just these next few decades. <coughs> However, a few things to highlight is that to go to the blue scenario, which is the only one that stays below 2 degrees with a likely chance here, 
uh, we have to uh, actually the uh, the emissions reduction are almost the same or even a little bit faster than the emission increase. And by 2050, which is this point here, the emissions have to be below their levels of 1990, on average by 50%. And by the end of the century, it is more likely than not that we'll need to have net negative emissions, which means we'll be so good at sequestering carbon below the ground that we'll sequester more than we put in. So when we talk about radical emission reduction or the breadth and, sp and, and, and extent of what is needed to address climate change, I think this illustrates very clearly that actually if we're going to address climate change, if we're going to limit global warming below two degree with a likely chance, then we have all these radical changes and very rapid and extensive changes to make. If we're not going to do this, then we're going to have to have very radical adaptation to be made following this red uh, scenario. And if we want to be in the middle, then we have to actually gain quite a lot of knowledge and possibly make radical changes both for mitigation and adaptation. Um, quickly, uh, here in this graph, again, the temp uh, sorry, this is time here on the x-axis. Again, the emissions, Annex B are all the rich countries here. They're, all these groups are about 1.2 billion people. Uh, you can see that uh, Annex B, the emissions are not related to wealth after some time. This is very clear here. There was development in the Annex B countries and that has stopped and the emissions no longer uh, uh, increase in these countries, possibly decrease, although it's not very clear at the moment. But in countries that are developing now, the emissions are increasing very fast. So that complexifies the landscape of climate change mitigation and adaptation because obviously it is extremely tightly related to development uh, issues and that uh, one of the major issues is the how to ensure development uh, without uh, having development pathways that essentially follow those of, uh, of the countries that are today the richest in the world. Very last slide here. <clears throat> I want to put things in context, a long time context here, 3,000 years. Some periods in history are more uh, interesting than others. Uh, there was the discovery of the Americas at some point. The Earth uh, rotates around the sun and not the other way around. And I think that we live in one of these extremely unique periods in the history of, in the prehistory of humanity even. This red arrow here is when I was born, 3.4 billion people, and we're here now. I mean, in the space of my lifetime, which is, you know, middle-aged person, this transition is almost half done. You're probably born somewhere here. If you, if you live your life the way, you know, following the life expectancy, you'll probably make it all the way to the end of the transition, doubling the population of the planet. So this is population here, world population. The projections are that this is going to stop, actually, this growth. This is going to stabilize or maybe decrease a little bit, maybe continue to increase. But this, this is a transition here. And the world here is going to be very different from the world that we had there. And what we're doing now is making this transition happen as smoothly as we can, as peacefully as we can, so that we leave a world behind that is actually acceptable to the people that will follow us and to ourselves. And some of the key points, as I said, is the 2000 COP meeting in Paris that will decide the targets for mitigation from 2050 and also a whole range of adaptation policy, including on finance, and on the other side here, you'll finish your PhD during that time scale. You might get a permanent job, I hope for you, at some point. But you have all these decades afterwards where you can actually influence the curvature here. And you can influence the curvature, the speed, the level. You have something that you can do in this transition. And although I'm, you know, I'm middle aged at the moment, I've seen a few things happen. And I think the thing that is the most useful thing in this climate change arena is leadership. Nobody knows what to do. All you have to do is just think about what do you think should happen and just make it happen. 
and with leadership from a lot of people, different people, different communities, different countries, I think that a lot of little efforts can spring, be coordinated, and then lead to something that is much nicer than just being there and not really knowing what to do and being a little bit um, with your hands open. Leadership, just do something. Thank you.